Um, my name is Melissa Falkowski, and I have been a teacher um, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, High School for 15 years. I did my student teaching there, and I started my teaching career there, and I've been there ever since. And I, I teach English, and I teach creative writing, and I uh, teach newspaper. My name is Eric Garner. I've been a teacher now for 26 years, 12 years at Stoneman Douglas, and 14 years in Dade County prior to that inner city school teacher. So I went from the inner city to Parkland, which is not, and we'll talk about that. Um, so I, we, you know, everybody always wants to know, you know, about our experience and, and some of that is um, in the book, but we wanted to start with, um, you know, February 14th. Um, and so we have um, some pictures here. This, you know, it was a Wednesday. It was just a regular day. And um, these are some of the students at lunchtime um, in the courtyard, you can see Emma, Emma Gonzalez is in one of these pictures and she was selling um, flowers in, in the courtyard for Valentine's Day. So just, you know, for people who think that she's a crisis actor, you know, who was like grabbed by liberals and, and her head was shaved and, and, and she gave her speech. But, you know, this is, you know, who she, this is who she is and, and who she always, and, and kind of who she always was. So, um, I mean, Eric will talk more about the crisis actor, you know, thing later. Um, and... Ooh, too far. And, and so Eric will talk a little bit about this. So this is how my day started. Um, it was Valentine's Day. And so of course, what does that mean? Lots of, all of you are in school, so. Uh, you know, you, you know. know. What that means. It's <laughs> chocolate highs, it's, you know, oh, this guy didn't give me this, and oh, is that carnation coming today when? Teenage angst uh, and. Yeah, all that other stuff. Um, so that's how we started the day. On uh, the left-hand side to you is the flowers that started piling up. I, I would love to think they were for me. They weren't. They were just <laughs> uh, that day's distractions, first, uh, first block. Um, unfortunately, this is how my day ended. Um, and it ended, what you're looking at is I, I actually teach in three rooms because I'm a like I said, I, I do broadcasting, so we have a control room, a studio, and, and a classroom. Uh, what happened, we collapsed back into my control room because it was kind of the safest place to be, and uh, we had to barricade in. So what you don't see is it's actually double doors there, and that's a bookcase uh, that's in front of one of the doors, and then that chair is me. That was my spot because I had 54 students in the room. Um, 40 of them were mine, 14 were other, and I could go over the whole active shooter and what you're supposed to do and all that, all that kind of stuff. I, I was a trainer at one point in that. Um, so I had 54 students in the room with me, and I said, if there's something is going to happen, that chair is me and they'll have to confront me first and if they go through me then it's up to you guys to keep the fight going so so, so um, Eric and I teach in the same hallway and um, we are across the school um, from where the shooting happened but um, you know, people say, I, I hid in a closet with 20 students for almost two hours and people say you're a hero and I hate that <laughs> I hate that because we were not um, like not in it. We were, but we weren't. Um, so, but we since we teach in the same hallway, when the SWAT team came, um, we all and everybody in our hallway ended up in my classroom. So, this is sort of a panoramic picture that one of the kids took. There were 166 students and six teachers crammed um, into my classroom. And you know, these are some of the other um, images um, in the bottom. When we finally got outside in the bottom right-hand corner, there I am with my emergency folder and kids with their hands up. And, and um, they're on the left-hand side, the SWAT, um, the SWAT guy who was sort of um, standing guard you know, at our door. Because at this point in time, they hadn't found the shooter. They didn't know where he was. And so they were going systematically through the school, trying to make sure that the threat had been eliminated. So this. This this is uh, this was our our day without getting into too much detail because um, more and more lately I struggle to get through that without um, like breaking down into horrible tears. But you can read about it in in the book. Um, so 
obviously, you know, the aftermath of this was uh, devastating. Um, there was confusion that day. The kids were scared. And it was sort of our job to, you know, keep them calm and, and make them feel that everything was okay, even though we weren't really sure <laughs> that everything was okay. And, you know, the grief and the loss of, of you know, so many people in our, um, in our community and the funerals and weeks of funerals. Um, and then, you know, numbness and anger. So we, we sort of have been through like all the stages, you know, the, like people are like the stages of grief, like those are real. <laughs> like we've been through them all. Um, and people that we work with are in sort of various stages of healing and not healing and angry. And, um, and so uh, we are still, you know, it's eight months later, we are still, you know, in that, in that aftermath. And, um, you know, and then we experienced, you know, the media bombardment and interviews and um, <laughs> Melissa became quite the, the, yeah. the face. You can Google for a me. While there. My son did. He for a little while he was, you know, I caught him in his his he's seven. I caught him in his bedroom on on YouTube, and he was googling my name. And there are all these videos of me being interviewed by like various news outlets. And I was like, you know, this isn't good for you. And he was like, but mommy, I just want to see you. And um, so yeah, I mean, I went on sort of like the great media tour um, of America because for a short time everybody wanted to hear um, what we had to say, and I felt like it was important for as long as people would listen to us um, to say what needed to be said because, as journalism teachers, we know the news cycle, we know things turn over, and like I'm not getting phone calls anymore for people to interview and ask me, you know, what I think about things. So. Um, some of us sort of seized that opportunity to say what needed to be said while people were captivated and while people were listening. Um, and it sort of felt like, um, I don't know, it sort of felt like my responsibility a little bit. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I just wanted to point a couple of things out there. Um, in the lower left, what you're looking at, every event, I believe, I want to say since Sandy Hook, there's a, a gentleman and I'm probably getting the state wrong, from Oklahoma, that builds crosses for every individual. And he, I, I had seen uh, what he put up at Pulse <clears throat> after that happened, and then I just happened to be there. I was, I was going by the school, happened to be there, and I captured that, that picture that you're looking at. Um, if you saw it in motion, it's two kids and they're in front of the JROTC kids and they actually saluted the, the cross that was there and it, it, was, um, it was powerful. It was, it was real. Um, yeah, I and, mean, this, and this is what we drove into for weeks. Yeah, Satellite months. trucks. Well, yeah, weeks and know. months and, and having these um, makeshift memorial in, in front of the school when we finally went back and banners which in the beginning was sort of comforting everyone from all over the nation. They signed these banners and they sent them to us because the school said, please don't send us letters because the mail, like you have no idea the mail that we received. It was, it was. Uh, and, and we it, were grateful. We were grateful, but it was, it was, it was over, it was overwhelming. And, um, you know, in the beginning, the banners too, like they were up on, in every hallway in the school and it, it felt, it felt like people were with us. But then after a while, you're like, when, when do we return to normal and when can we take these things down and when can we go back to the, you know, the everyday, like trying to get through our lives. And so that was, you know, that's, there's always like these weird negotiations, you know, like we're grateful to be here, but like we don't want to be here because of what horrible circumstances to have been invited here, you know? And so there's always that, um, that dichotomy now in kind of everything that we do. Like the kids find joy in, in these things and then they feel guilt about the fact that they are finding joy in these things. So it's a, it's a hard, um, you know, it's a hard thing to, to navigate. But we wanna, you know, talk about the students and, and them, their empowerment. And um, people said, you know, I would, when I would be interviewed, people were like, are, are you surprised, you know, that these kids are, are out there and they're saying this? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, you don't know these kids. You know, we've been working in this community for a long time and they were empowered before. Um, they had always been starting their own clubs and organizations and, and working for these causes and volunteering and doing all these sorts of things. And so this is who, this was their identity before. It's just that what happened then focused them, like they became focused and um, you know, they were outraged. How, like, how could this happen to us? Like, this shouldn't happen to anyone, and how did this happen, you know, to us? Um, 
but they were journalism kids and debate kids and student government kids and theater kids. All the, that core group of, um, you know, March for Our Lives, like that, that they were, they came up through these amazing programs at our school that empower kids every day, um, you know, to debate and to lead and to ask questions and, and, um, and so they were like, they were ready, like they were there and they were ready and, and, um, People would send us letters, and they would send us. I was telling Eric about this. I would some stuff I would have to throw out, but they would they would send us our their talking points. Like the kids didn't need talking points. Like they had their talking points. Like they were ready, <laughs> you know. Um, it's funny because uh, within 24 hours, 48 hours, all the crisis actor things came up, and is is a broadcast journalism teacher. It was the most backhanded compliment ever. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I didn't know if I was supposed to say thank you because I trained them so well or, or, or what. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was surreal, you know, because these were kids that I, I had had a lot of the, the kids, like David Hogg. Um, that's what David did. He picked up his camera and he went, and that was... He had done that for every other event, anything else that had happened in the city. This happened, and so what did he do? He picked up his camera and he went. Um, and so uh, it, that, that training was there. You know, it was always there. Um, yeah, I'm going to add to that. Like, it's a, it was instinctual. Um, like, when we, as soon as we emerged from the closet, um, we, and we share some students who were both um, taking print, you know, the print newspaper class and, and the broadcast class. As soon as we, you know, emerged from the closet, you know, one of our students, he, he has his camera out and he's videotaping everything and he's taking pictures on his iPhone. And, like, the instinct that they had, like the news instinct aspect of it, like, it, and, and even when we were, you know, in the, in the closet together, I said to the kids, um, I don't know what's happening, but I think we're gonna have to start over on our next issue, because we had already started production. Because whatever it was, you know, it didn't, if it was, even if this was some kind of like crazy drill, which made no sense based on the time of day, even if this was some crazy drill, like, wow, this is intense, and we're gonna have to write a story about this and how people feel about it. Um, and so that instinct was there um, already. And I, it's because, you know, Eric and I were talking about this last night, like we're training, I'm training my kids to be the next, you know, I hope New York Times reporters and Washington Post reporters. And he's, you know, training his kids to be the next generation of broadcast journalists. And so, you know, it, it is amazing to us because I think it means we're doing a good job. <laughs> they were like, you know, they were ready. Thank you. Um. Uh, so yeah, these are just some of the pictures of um, that are some that Eric took and some that our student journalists um, took. You know, the this that top left corner of um, Delaney speaking um, at a rally in Fort Lauderdale, and that rally in Fort Lauderdale is kind of like what launched Emma Gonzalez. That's where she gave her, um, you know, you know, we call BS uh, speech and uh, captivated you know the world. Um, and you know, they got on a bus within the, you know, a few days of the shooting and went to Tallahassee to demand change of our, our state lawmakers. And they did ultimately get, um, you know, the first um, gun control legislation in Florida in over 20 years. Um, wasn't everything they wanted, but, but they did, you know, get something. And then, you know, went on TV and said, we're going to have this march in Washington. And we were all like, what? And then, <laughs> and then you know, and then, and then there we were, you know, and um, the newspaper ended up um, covering March for Our Lives as, as guest correspondents of The Guardian. And so we were there kind of in two capacities as survivors and, you know, you know, as, um, you know, staff and students of the school and, and then also as journalists, you know, to report the story. And, um, you know, the kids talk about um, those experiences, you know, in the book. And we had so many offers and opportunities that were coming our way, and it's impossible to do them all. So, you know, for me, it was selecting the ones for the kids that I felt were the most, um, the most impactful and the most um, healing and, and a way for them to express themselves. And so that was, um, you know, kind of uh, my, my direction, you know, in terms of which projects should we do. And that's kind of also how we ended up, you know, doing this book, which is such a different, um, such a different experience for us. I know on our side, uh, we kind of had a goal 
It, it was funny, when we got back to school, it, it took us two weeks to get back in, into school and start up, and uh, we were given administration, and I have to, I, I will say our district administration, uh, did a really nice job that first month of kind of, listen, just we're happy you're here and we're happy they're here. Right. They were like, don't teach. Yeah. <laughs> so they said we're working on so, you know, social emotional health and we were like, okay, great. But it was, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to be told not to do what you like, but you can and they can and it's, a, it was, I don't, there's no word to describe like how weird of an experience that was. And so they like gave us all these resources and you know, so it's like we had board games and, and puzzles and, and all these things for the and kids to do. Bean bag chairs. Yeah, and bean bag Lots chairs. Bean oh, and they gave stress balls. Everywhere. Oh my God, that's the worst thing ever. The kids just throw them around the room. It, it doesn't come out the way you think. You think everyone's just gonna like, no. It, so oh, bad. I, I found out you're not allowed to throw them at the kids. So bad. Just because you're stressed out. That's, so, that's so verboten. But Let's but that only that on lasted for like a couple of days, and then we were like, now what? And the kids were like all on their phones. It was just such a weird, I don't know. It's such a it, this year when we, I mean, this year is like by no means normal. But at least like when we came back to school, we, it was like a reset button, and it was like, and then we came back from spring break last year, and they were like, okay, teach, and we were like, wait, what? They just spent all these weeks doing nothing, and now you want, you know, like, as teachers, like, at the beginning of the school year, you're like, this is how it is, and this, 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 and then as the year goes on, you can kind of, like, lax, but you don't start lax and then go, you know, you can't right, get it back. back once up. you let it go, like, that's it, you know, and so it was just, it was such a weird, it was such a weird thing, and we were like, okay, and everyone just kind of, you know, well, we all do our best. For, for me, um, here's what happened. I, I that day, and, and you'll notice that, depending on who you're talking to from, from the school, they'll call it that day, they'll call it the, the incident, um, but it, it is- shooting, or yeah, there's lots it, of- it's, it, it's very unusual, and, and you'll hardly ever hear me in eight and a half months now, calling it the shooting is very, I don't do it. I've like- I do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I do. But that day, I, I ended up in parent reunification in a room that looked like this. And I ended up with the parents of the children that didn't come home. And uh, there were only two of us from the school there, and it was just by happenstance this occurred. Um, and it was, it was horrific. Um, and it was, I, we don't have enough time. To, to cover that yeah, part. We could talk to you but, for hours um, about it. <laughs> that <laughs> night, by, by that time, by, by the end of the night, I knew I wanted to document this. And I knew that I couldn't prior to that. Because I, I was a photojournalist, I worked in television, um, and, and usually my instinct was grab a camera and start shooting. And that day I was like, I, I can't do that. And so finally, when I started to have a little bit of a quiet moment, I said, we need to document this. So when we went back to school, I gave my advanced kids this option. I said, you can help me put together a documentary. And we were going to our national competition uh, March 14th, basically a, a month to the day. Or you just, you do whatever you feel like you need to do. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to laugh, laugh. Whatever, you know, if you want to be involved, be involved. If you don't, and so it, it was kind of this nebulous thing, but most of them wanted to get back to work. They wanted to, to jump in. Um, yeah, I would, I would say it was the, I mean, it was the same way in the news, like in our newsroom, we were, you know, the, the next day there was a vigil and, you know, I had to send this text to my students, like, I don't, you're not already, no, you're not ready, but if anyone feels like they can take pictures at the vigil and interview people and sort of capture this moment, like, this is, this is our story and no one else is going to tell our story better than, than us and who will be more compassionate in their reporting than the students who were there and understand what it was like to be there that day. Um, and so we were up and reporting, you know, within 24 hours, um, you know, of, of the shooting. I, I call it the shooting because that's what it was. And I don't know. There's some of us that feel really strongly about that. And there are other of us that call it the incident and the tragedy and the, and the whatever. Um, 
And so, um, you know, the, the school was very supportive of March for Our Lives without, um, they're very, they were supportive of this idea that the students were going to become active and activated and, and participate in politics and, and lobby politicians and have this march, but they weren't, um, they weren't supporting one ideology over another. So everyone seems to think that, you know, there's 3,300 kids at our school and 260 staff members. Like, we're not all March for Our Lives. You know, it's not possible for everybody in that size of a community to be on the same page. Um, the vast majority of our school supports the March for Our Lives movement. And we do have, um, you know, students who are conservative and, and um, you know, more uh, pro second amendment and the school was supportive of the kids no matter where um, like no matter where they fell on the spectrum which I think was really important you know we tried we helped the kids when they needed help um, you know organizing and and we supported them in you know their bad moments and their good moments and I think that was really important but the school didn't take a side and say um, okay our school is March for our lives which I think is really important because there we're cultivating empowerment for all students regardless of um, you know what they what they felt and where they fall on the political spectrum so that was really um, you know important I think we're we may be getting a little short on time and I know you guys probably have a thousand questions for us. And I, I'm gonna tell you this, nothing's off limits. Ask whatever you want. Yeah, to. we're gonna say, yeah, so, so I just to, the, you know, our book, we did it because it was therapeutic for the kids and we did it because it's like a permanent record of what, what happened to us and it, it keeps the conversation going. You know, it just came out this month and you know, we hope that it's, you know, people will buy it and read it and, and keep talking about this issue for years to come for as long as it takes, you know, for us, you know, to address these, you know, these issues that are important to the kids. Yeah, so uh, ask us anything, go ahead, yeah. yeah. I'm Mary Charters. I'm a school librarian on Long Island, and I had the privilege to attend the culminating, culmination of the March for Our Lives event in Newtown, Connecticut in September. And uh, your students are really a testament. Um, you know, kudos to you, because those kids were so impressive. The way they spoke and the way they inspired the adults around them um, I'm, I'm so glad to like think back to that day because we need the hope and, and those students are the hope and unfortunately through those tragic circumstances, you know, they, um, they've really been impressive. The thing that broke my heart about that day though was the lack of media covering that event. It seemed to me they all jumped on board right after the tragedy to cover it but they should have been there in Newtown for the final event. It was the joining together of the people from Sandy Hook and you know the Parkland students and to have those two communities which were so impacted by those tragedies and not have any noticeable media presence there really broke my heart. So I would ask you like if you have a room here of hundreds of people who I'm sure would like to carry your students' message forward and help them in any way that we can. Um, do you have anything for us or any suggestions as to how we can support your students in keeping this message alive? Yeah, I, I think um, the kids, I think, really recognize that you can't, you can't count on the national media to carry your story because, um, I mean, there are a lot of issues in America and our attention span is short and the media's attention span is short. And so um, I think if you look back historically, all great movements were grassroots and so it's person to person. And so I would say that it's making an impact in your local level. Um, I just went to the summit in D.C. last weekend. It was a gun violence uh, summit for students, and it was 150 kids from across the nation, and they came up with this Bill of Rights of what they want to see um, change. And then each one of those individual students took that back to their state, to their city, to their town. So, I mean, my recommendation it, to support the kids is to, you know, get involved or if you don't have a local chapter, um, and encourage kids to get involved on issues that they care about, because you know maybe gun violence isn't their issue, maybe they then there's something else, and they can make a difference, and they can start in their local communities, and we can we can fuel that, and we can um, we can make change on a small scale, and that that change can grow into be something bigger. 
Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, as a former journalist, being, you know, and I, and I actually happened to be on a news desk when Columbine happened. So it was, it was kind of strange to be on the other side of those phone calls. Um, but there's a great learning lesson in, in what you just said, that the news cycle is the news cycle, and as unfortunate as it is, uh, it keeps moving. And it's, it's how you put yourself out there and how you keep the dialogue running. Um, and that's the tough part. When I, when I was talking to the kids, I, I never gave them my opinion. That was one of the biggest things I said. Um, it was something I, I felt strongly that it's not, this is not my movement. This is their movement. Um, but I, I said, up until the march, I was like, okay, you guys have, it's 39 days. Once the march happens, then you need to sit back and go, what's the long term? What does this look like? What is, you know, because this could be a lifetime thing for some of them, or it could be a November 6th thing for them. And how are they gonna, and now when I'm talking to them, because I, I, I talked to one of them yesterday, I talked to another two days ago, what are you gonna do November 7th because what, part of it is you need to go to college. It's time, you need to be, you need to balance life. Because there's life out there too, beyond this. And they've been going 24 seven and, the, and I know them, I've known them you know, for their teenage life and I know they're tired. And, and, but they're still, they're, they're still pumped. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it is, what's your long term? What do you, you know, in, in trying to help feed them, support them. I text them every once in a while, I go, did you sleep last night? You know, I, I, I go dad on them. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, I think if you look, if you look historically at, you know, like the civil rights movement and that, that was, you know, people getting together, you know, in these local communities and having marches and then eventually the media came to them, you know, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's what we all do individually every day in the conversations that we have and going to the polls and encouraging students to do something on a local level, something that they can get involved with, that they can control either in their school or in their state. And I think that, you know, that's what breeds national change. Like, the kids knew that they weren't just going to get, you know, they weren't going to get gun control, like, right now, and the president's just going to sign a bill, and that's that. Like, it's a long, it's a long game. You know, it's a, this is, issue in particular, I think, is complicated, and it's a very long game. And so we can keep it going just by talking to each other and, and making it important to us, you know, when we vote and encouraging students to do the same, and, and what can they do in, on a small scale. We have uh, two more questions. Yeah. Uh, here's one. Hi, uh, my name is Connie Laws and I'm in Manhattan. And I have a personal connection to Sandy Hook. My niece was a student there and her babysitter's daughter was killed. And my brother and sister-in-law were with the parents when they were told about their daughter. And there are parents who have become activists since then who've been um, the victims, I'm going to say, of a barrage of naysayers of, with death threats and um, they've had to hide out. It's been really, really awful. And I'm wondering if any of the people in your situation have had similar problems um, and how they deal with that. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, David Hogg, I've had <laughs> I, his, in, almost his entire high school career I had David. Um, so I, I know his parents. Um, if you don't know his parents, uh, his mom is an elementary school teacher. Uh, his dad is a former FBI agent. And, you know, if you want to look at 180 degrees on a scale, you know, politically, that's what David grew up with. Um, I'm friends with her, his mom on Facebook. If you look at what he, it's, it's horrific. Twitter, horrific, how she's... And she, thank goodness, she is a strong person. She's an incredibly strong person. And she fights, and there were times that I would jump into the fight because I, I just couldn't watch from the sidelines how, how she was just being attacked. So, um, unfortunately, when you put yourself out there politically, I mean, I ran for office in, uh, years ago. 
And I, I learned that lesson real quickly that when you put yourself out there, you put yourself out there. And um, there are a, a lot of positives and you just, you're gonna get punched. Yeah. And you just can't, it, the biggest thing is, even though you get knocked down, you gotta get back up and keep moving. So yeah. that, that the delete and advice. the block buttons are are their friends. Like they <laughs> yeah. delete and they delete and they block people, you know, all the time. But like Eric said, it's just the you know that's the the negative downside to putting themselves out there. And unfortunately, there are people out there that can be that hide behind their computer screens and they will say things to them on the internet that they would probably never say to their face. But last what, last week of school, last week of school or second to last week of school, uh, they got swatted. Yeah. Somebody called it, if you guys don't know what that is, they, um, they basically said they that called the police and said someone was armed in their home and then the police showed up, the SWAT team showed up to storm their house. And that's a, you know, that's a super dangerous um, you know, situation. We had two students in the movement that were um, victims of that. Unfortunately, no one was uh, David, David and his family, uh, so I hear the SWAT team surrounded their house, the hostage situation, the whole thing. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just text David real quick and, you know, are you okay? And David goes, yeah, I'm fine. We're in D.C. Yeah. Yeah, they were a thousand plus miles away. Um, but SWAT team knocked down the door, went in, the whole thing. We were on lockdown. At school it, because the, the they live in the were. area. So, yeah, um, I mean, it's just, unfortunately, it's a negative consequence. And I would say, you know, there are people out there that are just, you know, they, they hide behind their computers. And also some of it, you don't know how many are like, Russian bots and how many are real people or right. duplicate accounts and whatever. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt because you don't really know. But ooh, next question. Hi, my name is Geely. Um, I teach around the corner at um, Brooklyn Friends School. And um, I'm curious to hear a little bit about um, we also experience gun violence in the neighborhood and um, our students come to school experiencing trauma. Educators are also coming to school experiencing trauma and I'm wondering if you have advice um, or thoughts um, for educators, um, librarians, people in the community who are experiencing trauma within uh, where they are, their local community and also like on a grander scale we are all many of us currently are experiencing trauma um, and what that's like as educators to, um, if you have comments yeah, about that. This, this is the part where we're gonna cry. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a hard thing because um, I think it's for educators, for, the, for us it's supporting the kids and understanding um, that the, some of the kids in front of you have experienced um, horrific trauma and that their brains are, are wired differently as a result of that and understanding that and knowing that and being supportive of them. And then on, for yourself, it's, um, it's okay not to be okay. Um, it's okay to not be able to get up and go to work some days. It's okay to see a therapist. I do. Um, I thought I was fine over the summer. I was fine over the summer because I had not to be anywhere except with my kids and my husband. And then when I went back to school in August, I was so angry, like a level of anger that I knew was unhealthy and it was recognizing that and knowing that that wasn't good for me and it wasn't good for my own children at home and it certainly wasn't good for the students that were standing in front of me and recognizing that and saying I need I need to go back you know to to my therapist and um, you know just knowing that that is okay and encouraging other students to to do that because I think if you ignore your trauma then it doesn't it, it's not healthy and it's not good for you so it's acknowledging that and helping students acknowledge you know that I have um, I don't even know if I'm allowed to, but I have recommended students to go to therapists. Yeah, I'm sure that's I'm sure that's probably a no-no. But um, you know, you have have kids now come to us and tell us, you know, these things that they're experiencing and knowing that they're not okay, and and then trying to get them the help that they need. And um, you know, and also I would encourage people that are survivors of gun violence to join this incredible network of people, um, the survivors network of of people, because those people truly understand, you know, what. Um, you know what you have been through and there's every type of, of person um, you know every every town is a is a great network of um, survivors and um, we've had the um, pleasure and un unfortunate um, ability to meet um, a teacher from Columbine and a teacher from Sandy Hook and a stu I've met a student survivor from Columbine and um, and Sandy Hook and those people really understand. So just finding other people that have experienced a similar trauma, I think is really helpful to get you through. To me, uh, I'll 
personally, the biggest help that I ever received, because about a month afterwards, um, well, uh, there's a couple of things. I have the long answer for this. I'll try not to do. But uh, when I got divorced, one of the teachers that I was friends with sent me a, a, a picture of Dory from, and then underneath it it said, "Just keep swimming," and it was like, "Oh my gosh, you know, that's what I needed to do." Um, and my advice that I started getting from outsiders was the same thing, you know after this event had happened. Um, and you don't want to. You kind of, there's a part of you that loses that will to keep swimming, and you have to. Um, and it's very difficult. And uh, there, there are days I wake up and I'm just like, I can't do it. I just can't. Um, and that's not fair to my students. It's not fair to my, my peers. Um, but I'm only, I'm only me, and I can only do what I can do. Um, and I have to recognize that. You know, I, I've, I've, I've started kind of writing this little speech in my head called I'm in the mud, um, because I think a lot of people give you this advice that, you know, well, you're, you're a teacher, you, you get in there, you're on the boat, and you're pulling your kids onto the boat with you, you know, you're pulling them out of the mud. And they don't realize that, yeah, but we're people too. And we're in the mud with them. And we're doing our best to grab the kids and, and kind of put them on our shoulders and keep walking. You know, and we, we keep on hoping for that day that we hit solid ground. Um, so I, I think that finding someone to talk to, finding, uh, you know, your own support group. Uh, for me, it ended up being a group of TV teachers, and they'll text me, and we're, we're horrible to each other, and we're stupid and everything else, um, which is good, because it's, it's, it's normality. So um, I'll, I'll tell you something that's straight from the teacher that came from Columbine, because she, of all the therapy that I've talked to, therapists, everything else, she was the best, because she, she was one of us. Yeah, and, and she told us how it was and how it really was going to be and what we really could expect. And that was what we needed to hear more than anything else, like more than the district telling us, you know, we support you and we're here for you, which, mm, okay. Um, and it, she was just, she said, this is what it was like at our school for the next three years. And this is what it was like after that. And that was like a sobering reality, but also like so helpful because then you say to yourself, okay, can I do this trauma-infused classes filled with kids that have, you know, faced unspeakable, um, seen unspeakable things, and can I do this for three more years and then and then return? Because she said people will say this is your new normal, and she said this is not your new normal, so don't think that it is. It's your temporary normal, and your new normal comes later. And that was, like, such an important thing for a lot of us to hear. And so that's why I said, like, the Survivor Network, because they – tell you what's real and they tell you how it really is and that has been like so help that has been so helpful for us and it's been helpful for the kids to find um, student counterparts as well out there to support them so we, we want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity uh, to come talk to you I know we could talk to you time. for five more hours <laughs> thank you very much